Welcome to Talking Buffalo, featuring conversations with guests from around the world of sports, media, pop culture, and all things Buffalo, with your host, Patrick Moran. All right, what is going on, everybody? How you doing? Welcome to another episode of Talking Buffalo, your weekday daily driver for Buffalo Sports Talk and more. Today's episode is presented by Golf Dojo. Your space, your time, your game. Bring your game to Golf Dojo, Western New York's best indoor golf experience. Visit mygolfdojo.com. A couple quick notes before we get into today's episode. If you're watching this, and of course, I appreciate you if you are, you're listening, you're watching, whatever, when this episode is over, and let me emphasize that, when this episode is over, meaning watch the entire episode, but when it ends, head on over to Centered on Buffalo, that is Eric Wood's podcast. I had the great honor of being a guest on his show that actually drops today, so make sure you go check that out. And then if you are watching this on the video side, you might be able to see that little 26 shirts emblem. Shout out 26 shirts. Um, I went to the office at 26 shirts in Kenmore and I sat down with Dell Reed. That episode is going to drop on Friday on here. I talk about Buffalo. So make sure you check that out. And again, thank you to everybody out there as always for watching, for listening to this show. I appreciate you very much. I'm joined right now in studio, actually. By my buddy, Zach Kamich, who, by the way, technically, if you want to be technical, and you brought this up because I didn't really think of it, I was going to say first time ever, which is first time ever in video, first time ever in my studio, but technically you're a recurring guest. You've been on the show before, man. Back when it was Moranalytics, I was on this show. Moranalytics. <laughs> Way that back when. Right. Let's, um, I'll, I'll, we'll, we'll talk about, we're going to talk Buffalo Bills today. We'll talk a little bit of Sabres as well. Uh, got a lot of stuff on the play and we'll spend a few minutes getting to know you a little bit more, but let's kind of get right into that actually. So you were on the show once before as a guest, before you did any podcasting ever, you have a little bit of podcasting experience. In fact, I saw you on a podcast before quite a while ago, actually, and I was pretty impressed. I said, you know what? I'd like to kind of work with this guy before. And that's what we're doing today. But anyway. A Bills fan, that's what you are, born and raised a Bills fan, and I had you on the show for a specific reason. So for people out there watching or listening to this, how did you end up on my show? Back in December 2019, uh, when the Bills clinched the playoffs against the Steelers down in Pittsburgh, um, Mm -hmm. it was the first time that fans really went to the airport to greet the team there, and uh, (laughs) me and a few buddies went down there too. Um, and when the team got off the airplane, I thought it was, a, it would be a good idea to, you know, uh, video them all getting off. You know, it was like a, a memento type of deal. Um, and when Josh came off, um, I put, I put my buddy Ali on my, on my shoulders and I was like, Hey, let's go, let's go get a close up with Josh. Um, we got up, we got up to the fence line and, uh, Josh took my buddy's phone and took a selfie with us, um, which was at the, at the time, probably one of the greatest experiences I'd ever yeah, had at that point. Right? I remember it. Um, and, uh, we, we saw a video later that night of jo- uh, uh, from the bills of Josh, you know, taking that selfie and I put it in the comments and that completely blew up to the point where someone quote tweeted it and was like, you know, hang this in the Albright Knox. One thing led to another. It got hung in the Albright Knox. That's crazy. So then that's when you had me on the show to talk about it. Yeah, that was, so you were going to the airport and getting selfies with Buffalo Bills players kind of before it became fashionable in a way. Yeah. At some point it became too played out because now it's all the time. But back in these days, we're going back, what, five years now when Mm -hmm. you guys, uh, when you guys did that, which by the way, that was Josh Allen's first that was the first time that the Bills clinched a playoff with Josh Allen as the quarterback. They had made the playoffs two years before in 2017, but that's when they made it, you know, in probably in the last week of the season when they beat Miami and then um, Baltimore beat, or no, Cincinnati beat Baltimore. And that's how we got in. Yeah, to get in. But yep. So this was you taking a selfie with Josh Allen and, and your boy. And it's funny too, because I remember, I, I don't remember all the details, but I do remember our friend, our mutual friend, Jen, because I was, I was friends with Jen. I didn't know you at the time, but people knew you that I knew 
Mike Fee, of course, my man Mike. Um, that's how I got a hold of you, and I had to bring you on the show to talk about because it, it was uh, that's a big deal. First of all, just having the selfie at that time, at least in 2019, anyway, be on Twitter and then blow up like that, but to ultimately end up in the Albright Knox Art Gallery is uh, that was it was huge. Insane. You know, I didn't really think about it at the time, but looking back at it, it's like well, that's pretty cool. It like, is not it, a lot of people get works in an art gallery, especially something that big like that. So I thought that was pretty cool. Absolutely. Do you be honest though? Let's be honest now. So it's 2024, and maybe it's because you know the Bills were new to winning at the time. You know, getting into the playoffs. Now it's kind of like the standard, like. Going to the airport after every even remotely big game, I feel like it's a little bit played out now was, at this point. I was going to say, you hit the nail on the head. It's played out. Yeah. Um, a lot of things get played out, and I think it's it's still cool, you know, yeah. I guess, but you're absolutely right with the played out thing. They're, they're, <laughs> People started they're rebelling just, against it. They're just, they're just some things where it's like, it's cool a couple times. It's fun. It's, it's, enjoy, it's enjoyable, but... Sometimes it's just you. It's like it's like a hit song on the radio. <laughs> you know, you like yeah. it, and then it gets played so much. You're like, oh my god, when's it gonna end? For people out there who who want to hate on uh, people going to the airport after victories and and getting selfies, send your hate te- or tweets to uh, to Zach because he's one of the one of the kind of OGs when it comes to that that made it like like I said as popular as it got on social media. But in all seriousness, it's actually a really uh. It's a really cool story. And that was a fun time to be. And it still is a fun time to be a Bills fan. And we're going to talk plenty of Bills in just a few minutes. But that's when it really started becoming fun to be a Bills fan. Like around that 2017, not so much 2018, but Josh Allen, exciting rookie anyway. But then 2019, making the playoffs. Should have won against in Houston. But still, that was kind of like when it really started becoming fun to be a Bills fan. And you also started getting the sense in 2019 that you had a legitimate star quarterback on this football team. Right. right. It, was, it was definitely, you know, I, I heard someone say the other day that this is another golden age for the Bills. And, you know, while we're not making the Super Bowl, you know, you're absolutely right. Or, well, yeah. they were absolutely right in saying that um, because we had 17 years with, between a playoff draw. I'm 26. That's what my, I wanted to get to next. You know, my, I was going there next. <laughs> my entire upbringing for the Bills was, you know, seven to nine. Six and yeah. ten, mediocrity. You know, picking tenth in the draft, and now, now that now that they're good, it's 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 unbelievable. You know, and and it makes me it makes me envy how you guys must have felt when they were going to the Super Bowl. Even though you know, obviously, we all sure. know that they didn't win one in the four times that they went. You know, it had to have been just awesome living here at the time. I was just about to go there now too. So there is, and at times. I actually like when I got a big age gap with somebody on as my guest. And this is one of those times because you wonder what it's like to be older and kind of live through so many different eras of Bills football. And that's exactly what I did. So I'm, I'm far older than that. And oh, I, I knew the, of the Bills by the late seventies, like OJ was before my time. You know what I mean? But early eighties, the Bills were pretty good. Mid eighties, they were a complete laughing stock. I remember vividly, I was becoming a young teenager back to back two and 14 seasons, 1983, 1984, they draft Jim Kelly, not just Jim, but you know, the Andre Reed, Daryl Talley, Thurman Thomas, all these guys come over a handful of years and they become this dynamo, a, like you said, the Super Bowl, the golden era of the Buffalo bills. And then it's kind of went back and forth and they went through 17 shit years. Right. And now they're a good team again. And I've kind of lived through all that. So I can understand from a young person's perspective, somebody in their young to mid twenties, it's like, well, what is it like to, to live during the bill Super Bowl era? Well, it was awesome. You know, it was, um, picture it now, but with no social media, of course, and stuff like that, right. just like kind of on steroids because it, it was insane. These guys were all larger than life superstars in Buffalo. But I kind of throw that back at you. And I wonder what it's like, to have only for the most part, you know, until now, but I'm saying you spent 17 years of your life, which is literally like two thirds of your life, man, with this team being bad. Like you're looking at Thanksgiving, you're starting to pay attention to the draft next year already. And where are the bills? You know, if they lose out, if they lose 40s last five, they could still get a top eight pick. Right. Just blackout games. 
Hmm? Blackout games, especially. Yeah, games. Were- you know, having to listen to <laughs> us play Jacksonville or Indianapolis, you know, on the radio. Yeah. Um, but it, you know, when you were when you were talking just now, what came to mind was the national media perspective. When mm-hmm. we were bad, you know, we were always, you know, why isn't the national media talking about the Bills? Why isn't the national media talking about the Bills? Right. And you fast forward to now, and you see, you know, everyone's talking about the Bills, you know, whether positively or negatively, sure. or so be it, you know, but. The You're saying are, the bills were irrelevant, uh, right? Pretty yeah, much so, at that so time, the, the relevancy has you know completely shifted 180 from you know uh, the drought to now, which you know obviously comes with winning. But you know you, you have, you know you've been bad for so long, and it goes go to what you know you were leading into about that was like the first, like you said, you know it's two years of my life or two two thirds <laughs> of my life um, where we've been bad and. It, it, I started to think, you know, where will we ever be good? And it's yeah. kind of how I feel about the Sabres now. But, you know, um, once we broke through, you know, and the national media, like I said, started talking about us, you know, it was like a whole new feeling of, of fandom. Like, this is this is weird. They've been good yeah. your adult life. They sucked your whole childhood. It, 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 essentially. It's, a, it's not it's not a bad thing if you think about it, because, you know, I get to have more fun as an adult, you know? <laughs> now that we're good, I'm Plus, a lot more they, fun. Plus, it know? also could teach you some life lessons as, as a child. You're like, well, let's have lowered expectations. Yeah, because we're never going to make, <laughs> we're never going to make the playoffs. You know, you brought up a good point, too, that I, I kind of want to hit on. Nationally, the, the Bills are, whether it's for, for good or bad reasons, they're relevant now. And that was definitely a thing for 17 years where they weren't. And now it's been, you know, the past couple of years, it's been the Bills have been the Super Bowl favorites. If they're not the Super Bowl, you know, the first team, the, the um, their second or third. They've been like that for the last couple of years. Now it kind of seems like things are shifting. The Bills are still probably like a top six, seven team in terms of Super Bowl betting odds. But nationally, from a perspective, from the media and stuff, it seems almost almost universal that people are expecting the bills to take a couple steps back this year. I've highlighted, unfortunately I gave them the time of day, but Emmanuel Acho was on Fox sports one over the past week saying the Bills super bowl window is not just slammed shut, but there's drywall over it. There's bars again, things like that get said for effect. But anyway, my point is, you know, 2021, 2022, 2023, even it was the bills. Everyone expects them to get to the Super Bowl. Now it's kind of like everyone's nationally is expecting the Bills to take a step back. You kind of get a sense seeing a lot of that with the media. I definitely do. Um, I think I also think a lot of it. Uh, people like having new toys. You know what I mean? Sure. Um, and now the Bills have been you know good for so long, but haven't broken through. I think people are starting to look for a new team that can try to break through and you know get past Kansas City in the AFC. Um, but without even seeing how you know the Bills will be you know, this year at all, you know, right. you know, we haven't yet, we're barely even through mini camp. You know, we <laughs> haven't been to training camp. We haven't been to preseason. We don't know how this, you know, sure. yeah, there's a lot of new faces. There's a lot of new faces on the defense. Um, but we haven't even seen it yet. You know, until you play the games, I don't know how you even bet against the bills when the AFC still. Well, based on history, I mean, it would be flat out like disrespectful to dismiss the bills. The same token, I can understand if you're a national person, and you're not covering one team. You're covering essentially 32 teams. And you look at, you gloss over the offseason. I feel like it's easy to, to pinpoint the Bills as a team that looks primed to take a step back. Because you go, again, you go through the roster. You lose Jordan Poyer. who has been an all-pro safety and, and a part of the nucleus of this football team. You haven't officially lost Micah Hyde. Because I still ain't sold that the dude ain't going to be back. I'm just going to put that out there too now. He might be back. But right now, he's not back. He was a big part of this team for many years. Hard and sold that football team. I might even argue that that safety tandem. You lose Trey White, a great corner. And we'll get into how maybe, you know, losing big names hurts. But maybe on the field, some of these guys, you, you might not necessarily be having even a downgrade. But anyway, you lose Trey White, a big name. You lose Mitch Morse, a a big name, a leader. And these are all leaders on this football team. Part of what I'm getting at here. Um, You lose him. You caught him. You have to a financial decision. And then, of course, you trade, you know, Stefan Diggs in early April. So 
those are some big name players and guys who over the last four to five years have been some of the best players on this football team. You lose them all in a matter of four to six weeks or so. And it can be easy for the national media if they're not really, they don't have a magnifying glass on this team or they don't know this roster well. It can be easy to conclude this seems just not that good right now. Absolutely. Yeah. Absolutely. I mean, it's, and it was, it's easy for it. It was just as easy for them to crown the Dolphins one year ago, you know, sure. about today, you know, when, and then the Bills went and won the division anyways. So, I mean, <laughs> yeah, you know, did. what a difference a year can make, as they say, you know. What kind of style? And we'll, we'll see through, you know, this episode, future episodes and stuff like that when you're on. When it comes to podcasting, like you, you podcast through the lens of a Bills fan. I get that sense already. I can tell it, which is cool because my, my thing with podcasters is be true to what you are. Like there are some Bills fans out there who try to pretend they're not Bills fans when they're creating content. Mm -hmm. There's some Bills fans out there who try to pretend that they are, but they're really not, you know, to get people to like what they got to say. You like to, to talk about this team, whether it's on this show or wherever, like through the lens of a fan first. That's right. Right. Mm -hmm. So I want to make sure. So everybody knows that. So when you say we, that's what Bills fans say. That's it's right. It's cool. They also wear Bills shirts. And which, Bills. by the way, is funny. I probably haven't worn a Bills piece of gear on this show in like maybe two years. And if you're watching the video, but this hat's dope, man. It matches my 26 shirts. I like uh, it a lot. <laughs> <laughs> Got to throw it on. Um, all right. So you said you talked about training camp not even being here yet. And it's not. We're about a month out of from training camp. And I kind of want to talk a little bit about where we think things stand right now with this team, like the good, the bad. First, some actual, um, I, technically it's news. Uh, Keon Coleman signed officially today or when we record this, I should say on Wednesday. So the entire draft class is signed. Again, this ain't like the old days where rookies hold out for long stretches of time because their salary for the most part is pretty much slotted as opposed to the way things used to be. But anyway, what were what are your expectations? I've talked about them, so I kind of want to get some insight for you. When it comes to Keon Coleman, before we kind of get into like the positions and stuff like that, but just him specifically, the newest Buffalo Bill, probably the most uh, talked about new Buffalo Bill for sure, in fact. Like, what are your expectations for him right now getting ready to go into training camp and as a rookie? I'm going to say this as someone who hasn't played, you know, major college football or in mm -hmm. the NFL. I think it, it I, I think historically it's easy it's a lot easier for wide receivers to transition from college to the league than a lot of other positions. Yeah. And with with Keon Coleman being, you know, you know, the first pick of the second round, but let, let's all let, let's he's say their you know, first he's their pick. first round pick. He's right? their first pick. Sure. So with how with how being a McDermott have drafted, you know, historically in the first round, you know, you, you kind of put those blinders on as a fan and you say, well, first round pick you know he's probably going to be pretty good i'm going to say this as objectively as i can being a university of miami fan ha, i forgot to tell people <laughs> that shame on you ever had to tell people that we're, we're both yankee fans that's dope your boy's uh he's a fan of the u i'm a notre dame guy it's another conversation for another time that's but right go um, but go ahead in all seriousness go ahead uh I, I was able to watch Keon Coleman, you know, in the Florida State Miami game last year, and mm -hmm. he he he's a man amongst boys. He's a big yeah. dude, and in Miami plays, you know, a physical brand of defense, and that didn't make a difference. I mean, he was all ACC last, or yeah, all ACC last year yeah. for wide receiver, special teams, and all purpose. Um, yeah, he he ran a four six forty, but he's a big dude. He can get up there. He's he had a good vert. He had a good vertical jump. I think he'll he'll uh, mesh into the offense pretty well. Is he going to be a number one right away? No. Could he potentially be that? Sure. I mean, I, I think that's what uh, the GM and the coach have in mind for him. But I guess that it just all remains to be seen. I think he'll be good. Yeah. I do. Let, let, you know what? You bring up a point that I, I believe in. There are a lot of people out there who really get into the draft and they spend hours and hours and hours and hours grading people, watching film. And of course, that's obviously how you're going to get the best perspective of a player. But sometimes if you're a fan of a specific football team and you only watch your team play during the season and you watch who they play and players that stand out who they play against, 
you formulate opinions. I'll tell you, as a Notre Dame guy, Michael Hall Jr. is a defensive tackle for Ohio State. And he was only, I, I think he ended up going in the third round, maybe the late second. I don't remember for sure. But anyway, my point was, I watched him destroy Notre Dame mm -hmm. to the point where I was screaming at my TV and shit. And so when it came to be draft season, I was pounding the table. This whole mock draft season, I was pounding the table for Michael Hall Jr. Pretty much based on what I watched him do with my own eyes <laughs> against uh, against Notre Dame. I mean, he was just absolutely um, killing him. I think it was, a, when it comes to Keon Coleman, you know, I, I think there was a little bit of a surprise in Buffalo because it felt like this was a team that was destined to take a guy best known for speed. You yeah. know, like it felt, it felt, and in fairness to fans and content creators, Brandon Bean kind of gave that speech that they're looking for explosiveness. So did y'all McDermott, that they're looking for explosiveness, really, really fast guys. And Keon Coleman plays faster than he is. And we've kind of learned since he's been drafted, we've learned a lot more about him. But he didn't really fit the bill of what we thought the team was going to do. So I think maybe initially, right when he was drafted, there was a little, I don't want to say negativity, but a little like, oh, really? You know, I think especially Keon Coleman. I think especially because with all of what you said and when the Bills traded out of 28, Xavier mm -hmm. Worthy was right there, yeah. you know, and that's, you know, your burner of the draft. And then that's who Kansas City ended up taking, you yeah. know, and, um, to piggyback off of that real fast, if if Worthy ends up hitting and if Coleman ends up not hitting, <laughs> not good. <laughs> I, I, yeah, not I'll good say right. this: the, um, Dwayne Carter's their third round pick that they got essentially for trading down from twenty eight to thirty three. He better be good. Yeah, if Keon Coleman is really good, then who gives a shit? I mean, I still care that Dwayne Carter is going to be good. But if Keon Coleman kind of flames out a little bit and Xavier Worthy does happen to become a star, then, yeah, D Dwayne Carter better be really good or that's just going to go down as an absolutely horrific um, trade for the Bills. But anyway, let's actually, I kind of want, you know, it's it's easy. We could sit here, whether I'm talking to you or anybody for that matter, or doing a show solo. We spend so much time talking about the offense because that's what, that's juicy. Oh, you know, yeah. The quarterback is juicy. The uh, Stefan Diggs getting traded. It's just such great discussion. But to me, what I think I like most about this football team, or I don't, shouldn't say what I like most, what I'm most certain about with this football team, kind of talking about like the state of this roster at this point, like I said, getting near training camp here, is I could count as if Matt Milano was out there, of course, and this is provided that you know, they stay healthy, which you could say the same thing about 31 other teams too. But if they stay healthy, I think the Bills front seven is almost guaranteed to be good. Like yeah. that is going to be a strength of this football team. Even losing Leonard Floyd, who led the team last year with 10 and a half sacks. Because by the way, though, he only had one sack over his last eight games. But you got Greg Rizzo going into what's going to be essentially a contract year. Vaughn Miller is now a full year plus removed from his injury and as shitty as he was last year. You saw you saw some signs in the playoffs of I don't want to say the old ball, but certainly not the the shitty ball that we watched all of season. I like AJ Vanessa at Oliver's there. Daquan Jones is back. Bernard became a star in his first year as a starter, and we all know what Matt Milano is. Right. And if you want to throw Teron Johnson in the new place, plenty in the box, so he technically is in that front seven as well. You feel like that's like kind of like the surefire strength of this football team right now. Yeah, absolutely, especially on defense, um, because that's you know that's that's your you know your essentially your seven guys who you either had someone come back in Daquan Jones who mm -hmm. has already been on the roster or guys who have already been on the roster last year. You won't have a lot of turnover there, um, and the experience is really going to help. I think because the defense, you know, has always been, you know, at, you know, at least or right around a top 10 defense. Yeah, they the statistically have been really good. Yeah. And especially the defensive line has always been, you know, in the, you know, top five, top 10 under McDermott. And I don't see that, especially the defensive line. I don't see that you know, dropping, you know, now with Daquan Jones back to plug up the middle and Gable Stevenson, if he makes the team, you know, he's a wrestling guy and McDermott can <clears throat> mold him if he, you know, mm -hmm. if he ends up making it. But, um, 
<laughs> yeah, I would definitely agree that the that the front seven is the strength of the team. I'll give you a uh, I'll give you a little bit of a hot take here. I think you might make the team for <laughs> before Gabe Stevenson makes his football team. I'll tell you that right now as a rookie. I, I would say maybe best case scenario if he does have a really good camp, which it is quite literally impossible to project a player who has never played football before. By the way, isn't that shit crazy? I mean, look, we're talking about the state of the roster and he ain't going to be on this roster, but I, he is worth having a, a quick conversation about here. But isn't it wild that a guy, what kind of great athlete you must be to grow up, never put on pads in your life. He put on pads at minicamp this week. Mm. It's the first time he's ever put on a full set of football equipment and played football in his life. Now, high school, or college, or little loop, none of it. And there's something about him that Sean McDermott, because this was a Sean McDermott move. Yeah. Sean's a wrestling dude. This dude's a wrestler, an Olympic champion wrestler. To sign somebody like that who's never played football. Isn't that wild? Like, what What was your reaction when you first heard that? Mine was, hmm. I don't, did he play college football at the University of Minnesota? I don't remember or something because I'm like, you didn't play no football. Uh, on any other occasion, I'd be like, who's Gable Stevenson? But because <laughs> he was such a prolific wrestler in college, you mm -hmm. know, that that's where I, I knew the name. And now I, I was actually kind of like, hmm, that's a PR move. <laughs> you know, I, I don't I, I also don't think he's going to make the team, but I you never know. Uh, but th that's that's the thing, I think, with McDermott being a wrestler. And I don't know, maybe he grounds a power. <laughs> you know, yeah. he, he maybe he plugs up. Maybe he's another guy that plugs up the middle. I mean, crazier things have happened. Are you a pro wrestling guy? I mean, we know, you know, from because he's a decorated, you know, amateur real wrestler. But you're not a pro. Are you a, like a WWE guy? You know, it's funny. I was never I, I never like watched it like. You know, I never watched Monday, Wednesday, you know, every week or anything like that. But I'll go back and watch, you know, clips from the 90s of yeah. uh, of, of, of them. Uh, that's where you miss everything. That's yeah. where you miss yeah. out being young. Sometimes being young like you, you've got definitely got its advantages. That, One of them, though, ain't being around for the attitude era of wrestling because that was awesome. But anyway, he was in WWE. I knew of him being a decorated amateur wrestler and champion. I, but I only knew that because he came into WWE and, uh, couldn't stand him in WWE. Right. He got a he got a pretty bad rap in WWE too, man. For uh, from a lot of wrestlers, like there were a lot of wrestlers who were not set. He got because he got laid off or fired or whatever you want to call it, released before he signed with the Bills. And there were not a lot of wrestlers out there publicly crying any tears upon his release. But again, you know, you you got to assume that Brandon Bean they pursued him a couple of years ago, actually, which is crazy. But him and Sean, you got to figure they, they had definitely had some conversations mm -hmm. with with the guy. Um, yeah, he's not he's not going to make this team, but he could make the practice squad. I mean, he could be a long term guy uh, for them. But regardless, they're 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 really good on the defensive line for sure. DeQuan Jones being back to me going into this off season, I said my number one priority, being realistic with the salary cap, was I wanted DeQuan Jones back because mm -hmm. last year. The first month of the season, he was probably the best player on that defense. He was almost unstoppable the first month of the year. Even better, as great as Matt Milano was, too. The, he was the guy, the anchor of that defense. And then he got hurt. Right. Then he came back late in the season, and he was just another guy because, again, he was playing, but he was not 100%. He's old. He's up there, but he could still play football, and he's going to uh, he's gonna anchor this defense. Good sign, by the way, Matt Milano at camp this week. Yep. Um, limited the first day on Wednesday. Still limited technically, but from everything I read and saw some clips, he looks really good. So that's promising. I think Milano's a guy that can miss the preseason, come back week one, and just be fine. Sure. You know. As long as he's healthy. Yeah. You know, yeah. Granted, <laughs> well, granted him being does, healthy. Uh, does it concern you a little bit, though, that we are into the second week of June, and he got hurt week four in London, which was what? early October last year and that he's still not quite 100%. Now, granted, there's still plenty of time before the season. And what we, I <laughs> got a thinking here on the fly, buddy. Minicamp, I generally hate. Joe from Queens gets me in his goddamn mode where OTAs don't mean shit. Minicamp don't mean shit. And by and large, it's 100% accurate. But this is the kind of case where it does mean something. Because just to see him on the football field doing stuff right now physically, to me, is by far the biggest story 
of mini camp this week. Yeah, because especially I think that's the type of the uh, type of injury where even just moving around is good. Yeah, you know, I, but this late, this late in in I guess in his recovery process, I I don't know how far along he's supposed to be, but I mean, you know, moving around is always a good sign. He's he's a legitimate all pro player. I mean, quite literally, he's an all pro player, and it's kind of. You know, one of the underrated storylines out of the last season about the Buffalo Bills was how good the defense still played for the most part, despite the injuries. Because look, I mean, yeah, they fell apart against the Chiefs. And that quite frankly, I think that's when Milano being out and Christian Benford didn't play that game. And Taylor Rapp didn't play that game. And Rasul Douglas was playing on one leg. And AJ Klein was coming off a couch and yeah. to try to cover Travis Kelsey. Injuries at that point caught up to him. But from week four in London, when they lose Matt Milano and Daquan Jones in the same week, all things considered, with other guys banged up a lot and stuff, it's kind of incredible to me that the defense played as well as they did, which gives me, like I said, go make it his front seven, a lot more confidence about this team in part because of the defense. It almost makes you, it makes you think that... It, not that they could put anyone in their secondary, but they could almost plug and play their secondary. And I think be still, you know, right around that 10, 15 ish, sure. you know, defense because McDermott can, you know, say what you will about, you know, some of his decision making in the fourth quarter and overtime of some games. Say a lot about it. Say so much about <laughs> it. But, um, you know, he can put a defense together. That's what he, that's what he does. He's a defensive coordinator at, you know, at, um, at heart. So, I, I'm I'm usually pretty confident in a McDermott defense. Yeah. No and, matter what. And we and we should be. Like I said, until it gets to the playoffs and uh fourth quarter of a game. But you know what? Get to the playoffs and get to the fourth quarter. And then you'll have a belief that eventually, you know, this will be the season where the defense comes up with a big play when it uh matters the most. Anyway, I want to take a real quick break, come back on the other side, talk offense, because I think the offense is different. The offense is about more younger, talented guys that are still ascending, where I think the defense is pretty rock solid right now. And then we'll get into a couple like red flags and concerns that we got with this team as well. So be right back. All right, I am back here in studio with Zach and Mitch. This episode, of course, is presented by Golf Dojo. By the way, you told me before the show, you're, you're actually, you go there? You're I'm right? a member there. Yeah. yeah, I go to the one on transit. I got to be honest with you, man. I've never been there before. Are you? I, I, I used to be a golfer. I lost the ability to play. I didn't play for a long time. Then I got my lungs got all screwed up and shit. Mm -hmm. I'm starting to try to get back into it a little bit, but I'm a lost cause. I can't do shit on the course. But a kid... He's 21 years old, hits the ball a mile. He, he's a good ball striker. He's not a good golfer right now. Mm -hmm. You know what I mean? But uh, anyway, we're going to be doing some work with uh, Golf Jojo, and I'm looking forward to, to, to going on that journey with him. Like Kind of like when he was a kid, played football. I lived vicariously through him. Right. We lived vicariously, by the way. Someday you get older, you have kids, you'll see. I don't care what it is. If your kid's playing football, baseball, if he's into music, art, whatever it may be, you're going to live vicariously throw your kid I'm telling you now it's gonna happen anyway i'm still doing that he's not a kid now and i'm a young guy or a young man i should say but anyway my whole point was he's gonna be going to golf to joe and doing some stuff it's pretty cool there yeah no it definitely is i like i like the way they have the trackman set up they have for members they have a members only bay it's real. it's private it's huge room it's got a putting green right on it yeah. i go to the one on transit i haven't been to the one their new one on the boulevard um, but yeah, the one on the one on transit, I really love it. I'll go, I go at least once a month, you know, at least to, you know, make sure the membership is you know, <laughs> Keep yeah, that membership yeah, going. Yeah. Um, but yeah, they have a bunch of courses to choose from on their, on their trackman system. You know, it's, it's great. I love it there. Then you could do things like if you want to just like practice on the range, you can see your ball flight and yep. the distance and the carry and the ball speed and your club speed and all that stuff. There's an option if you wanted to uh, do like a top golf kind of thing. It puts you in a top golf, and you know, you know you're just kind of like hitting, uh, wow. hitting balls at a range. Yeah, that, that, it's that's super cool. That's right. It's just so wild how much advanced the uh, visuals are now with golf. You yeah. know, again, not to sound like that old dude, but you know, when I used to play, it's like the, the most I could do is go on the driving range. And now, dead of winter in a place like Buffalo, to be able to go to like, you know, golf dojo and and be able to hit balls and still work on your game year round. It's, it's so huge. big for golf it's in huge. this area. Yep. Yeah, for sure. 
All right, so before the break, we were kind of talking about the defense and, and feeling relatively as long as Matt Milano's back and healthy and the team stays healthy, of course, um, defense is, is solid. And I think around the league, I think people think that. I think where the disconnect might be locally versus nationally is with the offense because, again, you lose Stephon Diggs and you lose Gabe Davis, by the way. I'm throwing out names. I forgot to mention Gabe earlier, too. It's your top two receivers and you lose your starting center, Mitch right. Morris. It's a lot of loss. In one off season. And we'll talk about the center position here in, in a few minutes. But when it comes to this offense, you know, unlike, like, again, Vaughn Miller and Ed Oliver, Matt Milano, these guys who are established good players. AJ Ebenez is a pretty established player at this point of his career. Daquan Jones, of course. The offense is kind of rooted right now beyond the quarterback, of course, and younger players who are still ascending. Like they haven't, you hope anyway, you know, they haven't hit their peak yet. Like they haven't even gotten into the prime part of their careers yet. You got Dalton King. How are you going to replace Stefan Diggs? Like that's the biggest critique. Anyone out there, whether you're local, whether you're national, if you're worried about the Buffalo Bills and their offense, how are you going to replace Stefan Diggs? Which by the way, because again, first time on the secondly, your first time on the show as a as, as an actual in studio guest. Anyway, let me ask you this real quick. Uh how surprised were you in early April? I don't know if you were at work that day or whatever, but I'm sure at some point you probably scrolled on Twitter or somebody texted you, hit you up and tells you Stefan Diggs got traded. I was floored at the time, stunned. I didn't think that they were going to take on that dead cat. I really didn't. No, so not this year. To, so, you know, to answer your question, I was at work. Um, I was driving my work truck. I delivered for Raymore and Flanagan. Um, and I had gotten um, an alert from the score. I just said, you know, Stefan Diggs traded and didn't even, you know, hesitate to look over my work partner and be like, yeah, we just traded Diggs. And for him to be like, no way, come on. Because <laughs> we're, 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 me and him, we talk all the time about like, you know, we're going to have to do this with Diggs being disgruntled. I just didn't think that we would take on the dead cat. So Not whatever, this year. Right, exactly. So whatever I thought or whatever happened behind the scenes had to have been to the point where, you know, the – the front office is like, this is that we're done here. Yeah, we got it. Enough. We, we got it. We got it. We got to make a move for sure. I, I'll tell you, in hindsight, it kind of feels like maybe we should have seen it coming. But at the time, I was definitely floored. I kind of went through the whole gamut of emotions over the trade. I'll say this too. One sign that maybe we should have saw this potentially coming at least was before the cluster of releases. A couple guys took pay cuts, like mm -hmm. Dawson, Dawson Knox ultimately took, Vaughn Miller took a pay cut. Guys restructured their contracts, and Vaughn Miller's contract wasn't touched. I mean, not Vaughn Miller, Stefan Diggs, his contract wasn't touched. And that made me think, because if they would have extended it for a year, or restructured it, I'm like, all right, well, that's pretty much locking them into Buffalo for, for sure this year, and right. probably two years, because that's the way it goes. If you restructure a deal, you're kicking money down the curb to make it harder to cut somebody after just one year. So I'm thinking he's safe. And then of course he wasn't. And at first I was like, wow. Then I'm like, all right, I get it. You got to, you got good compensation, a second round pick next year. I'm like, this is part of a, of a bigger move. Brandon Bean is a chess player. Mm. Like they're going to do something big here. This was my thought process at the time. They're going to trade for a Brandon Ayuk, or they're going to sign somebody or they're going to move up in this draft and when they got an extra second round pick they got more ammunition they're going to get one of the big three receivers something like that and when none of that happened then i got pissed off so then i went through a period of being pissed off so i went from understanding and thinking it was part of the bigger picture to being pissed off but as time went on you know time heals all wounds man yep. and i started looking at this offense i'm like all right well Instead of having that alpha male, that guy who gets literally 160 targets a season, they're going to be more balanced and distribute the ball more evenly. And they're going to rely on not one guy, but a cluster of guys who are going to grow together in this offense. And that's what I'm getting to here. Dalton Kincaid, year two. Khalil Shakir came on big time last year. He was more productive than Stefan Diggs back half of the year. Keon Coleman, who we talked about, a rookie. Um, James Cook is still a very young running back. He's only going to knee or three. They drafted a running back in the fourth round, who I think is going to have a role in this football team. 
There's a lot of young pieces on offense, so much so that Josh Allen's like the old guy now on the offense. But there's a lot of young pieces that are still ascending. They haven't hit their prime yet. Right. And if, if you want to add another name in there, Chase Claypool isn't that old. No, I don't believe in Chase Claypool. But, hey, there's could, a... He prove could, me wrong. He, he could, I, I'm willing to be proved wrong. I'm... I'm I was kind of... You're right, though. He's still young. He, yeah. like he's, it feels like he's a lot older than he is because, because he's, he's been through so much shit already. Exactly. And and for... Uh, he's two or three teams. He, the, yeah, he went from Pittsburgh, Pittsburgh to, to Chicago, Chicago to Miami. Miami and now Miami. He's, yeah, he's in Buffalo. And this is probably his last real chance, too. Yeah. So. We've we've had last chances before. Sure. You know? Um, I, I, I when, when we signed Claypool, I was just kind of like neither here nor there about it. I hated then, it. You know? <laughs> Um, but it was one of those things. It was a boomer bust type of thing, I think, because yeah. you know, I think the the potential's there for him. I think, but you know, that's the thing is, it's so far fetched because he's only proven that you know he's kind of just a flame out. You so. know, sure. And you know, it's funny is, you know how I just said a few minutes ago, and you know, screw mini camp, screw OTAs. Well, no, no, I love it because now I know Matt Milano's moving around and he's close to being ready to go. That's good. You know, it's not good about mini camp. Oh my God, Chase Claypool looks so good. He's making catches over this guy. Yeah, he's in part of the French fucking a, a jersey and a pair of gym shorts right yeah. now. You know what I'm saying? Like, do it with pads on. Do it when it matters against better, I don't say better competition, but against more intense competition. And then I might put a little bit of stock in there. See, you're going to send me down a Chase Claypool goddamn mm. uh, rabbit hole. And by the way, this is coming from a Notre Dame fan. I was going to say, you I know, mean, you're I, he was a Notre Dame guy. I, listen, because I'm I, even in college, he was a really good player, but you just kind of kind there's of something off case, about him, man. Right. And he was really good, but but you're not wrong because he was good at one time. He was really good early in his career in Pittsburgh. And then kind of the wheels came off and we don't really know. There might it might not all be all Chase Claypool's fault. It could be a combination of things. But he goes to Chicago and that did not work out. He goes to Miami. He's stuck behind Tyree Kill and Jalen Waddle. Didn't get much opportunity, but you know, also didn't do anything with the opportunities that he did get in Miami. I almost want to give him a pass for his time in Chicago because of how you know they're terrible. The, the, yeah, exactly. For, That's fair. You know, because of the organization, but you know. You're, you're, if you go from a great organization to a shit organization, would you, you know, be happy about it? Yeah, probably, you know? probably not. Maybe yeah. that, that, that's a fair point. I don't know. I think of Chase Claypool, and we're spending a lot of time on Chase Claypool right now. <laughs> <laughs> the guy's probably not going to make this roster. We're supposed to be talking about these yeah, young, like, ascending guys. But anyway, the last point about Chase Claypool, my, my, my lasting memory of him is running a really, and this is from watching the All-22 film and, and hearing a breakdown from guys like Eric Turner from Cover One, but a really lazy, um, not detailed route that Taylor Rapp was easily able to, to diagnose and jump in front of and get that game and division clinching interception mm -hmm. at the end of the Miami game. That was on Chase Claypool. But Chase notwithstanding, look, Dalton Kincaid was really good as a rookie last year. Like yep. I said, Khalil Shakir, who was looks like it's just an injury scare. Thank God. This week at camp, he didn't practice on Wednesday, but he was on the sideline, looked in perfectly fine spirits. He was really good. I believe to some extent in Keon Coleman. I actually, we didn't, and MBS, I, 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 I like him. I like his potential. I like what he brings to the table. I want to talk about him more specifically in a second here. But my point was this. In the state of this roster right now, I really, what I like about the office, besides the quarterback, of course, is that it seems all their skilled players and you can even throw Curtis Samuels, not old right into this mix. You know, they're still kind of ascending and not going to be reliant on Stefan Diggs. He's not forced the ball to, to step on whether he's covered or not. You know what I'm saying? That's what I like better about this offense right now. There's more there. It's going to be harder to cover because there are more avenues that they can go. Sure. You know, they don't, they don't have a clear cut number one. So, you know, one, one play, Curtis Samuel could be coming out of the backfield. Yep. It could be a toss to him because that's something that he does. Sure. Um, you know, there's a lot of different things that the Bills could throw at teams this year with, you know, and Joe Brady calling the offense. I'm I'm interested. I'm well, interested and I'm cautiously optimistic because, you know, like I said earlier, I mean, you have to bet on the Bills until you don't. <laughs> how how much do you think, like maybe the back half of last season, where I mean, who's the safety is escaping my name? Devin McCourty told Tim Graham. That he he thinks the Bills are trying to prove that they can win without without Stefan Diggs. Like the back half of last season, 
the Bills were winning football games. Now, the offense wasn't spectacular by any means, but the Bills were winning football games where Stephon Diggs' production took a nosedive last year. I think it could be true to say that Joe Brady's offenses as a whole um, never really centered around a number one receiver. Right. So I yeah. think I, you know, I, obviously, you know, the the latest and biggest example of that is, you know, his his year last year with Diggs. But like, he's never really had, a, you know, a, a number one receiver that he's you know, sure you know used and. You know, it's always kind of been, you know, three, four receivers that they use. You'll have a back out of the backfield, you know, and then maybe you throw a receiver in the backfield yeah. like because he, he had Curtis Samuel before. Yeah. Um, you know, his so. best year, Curtis Samuel's best year was when Joe Brady was offensive coordinator 2020 in uh, Carolina. Right. Exactly. So I, there's reasons to be optimistic about Joe Brady, Joe sure. Brady's offense, even without having a clear cut number one receiver. And that's that's not to say that someone could step up and be that still. Sure. You know? yeah, absolutely. I mean, who, who's to say Khalil Shakir can't catch 85 passes this year? Right. Or, or Curtis Samuel can't have a thousand yards receiving? 100%. Mm -hmm. People always say, well, how are you going to replace Stephon Diggs? You're, well, you're not. Well, you're not going to replace him with any one player. You're going to replace him with a bunch of people and be less predictable and, and hopefully, for their sake anyway, more balanced. And again, I even mentioned Ray Davis. There's something about that kid I like. I am taking a running back in the fourth round. I feel like there's something behind that, and he's going to have a pretty good role uh, on this team as well. The running backs in the mid rounds with with Brandon Bean, you know, you think Devin Singletary, James Cook, yeah. you know, that I, I think that's another reason to be optimistic about Ray Davis. Yeah, hundred mm -hmm. percent. All right, so like I said, offensively to me is about young ascending talent. So to be optimistic, defensively, I think that front seven is borderline if healthy, locked down, and I also think they're good at corner. Look. They're good on defense, except kind of turning the corner here. It's not all roses and, and flowers here with Bill's Mafia because you'd be sticking your head in the sand and being foolish if you don't think that there's any red flags or concerns on this football team. Even if you think Stefan Diggs is very replaceable and you know, was headed towards the downside of his career, even if you're right, and even if the Bill's offense is better, it doesn't mean it's not without question marks. I said the defense stout, and I could add corners to the mix too, but there's two major, I don't want to say red flags. Red flags is a bad use of words. Two major concerns or question marks that will need to be answered. Number one, the safety position. I don't think by any means it's a sure thing to have Taylor Rapp as your starting strong safety. Or maybe the rookie Cole Bishop, who will absolutely compete at camp with um with Taylor Rapp for that starting spot. In fact, that might be the battle of training camp. And then Mike Edwards, if he gets on the field, he is still missing time. He, he's something's not right with him. I think it's neck or something. I don't remember. Mm -hmm. But anyway, he'll be fine. But Mike Edwards is your free safety. They're good players, but even if Jordan Poyer and Micah Hyde were on the the, the back nine of their career. Deep into the back nine. Another golf reference here on there this podcast. Go. What's going on with golf? <laughs> you talk here today. I'm talking about it must be the U.S. Open. I trusted. I had faith, confidence in Poyer and Hyde. They they've been doing it together for so long. Yeah. It was like it was one of those things. Like you, they were sure fire going to be a top two, three safety tandem in the league. Just Absolutely. because they always knew where they were going to be. It was almost like they can, can they could communicate with by just looking at each other. One guy was going to cover the other guy, no matter what. Um, no matter what, you know, it was just it was so it it, it became comforting having them back there. Yeah, hundred you know? percent. And you don't look Pro Bowls could be popularity contests, but you don't make All Pro without being not just a good player, but an absolutely great player. Right? They were both great safeties. They are not the same safeties that they once were, hence why Micah Hyde is still sitting staying in shape at home, but mm -hmm. still at home. And Jordan Poyer is going to try to play for the Miami Dolphins, which by the way, I don't know if you know this, but they signed Marcus May this week as a strong safety from the Saints. He's going to have some competition for starting spot. If you don't yeah. win that job, his contract is only two and a half million dollars. So I don't think it's even a lock that Jordan Poyer plays for Miami this year. Selfishly, I kind of hope he doesn't. So I really don't want to root. I love Jordan Poyer. I don't want to root against him. But anyway, I'm going to get off track here. My point is this. Even if they're not still as good, you trusted them back there to, to, to make a play when you had to. I feel like with Taylor Rapp 
or Bishop and Edwards kind of got to earn that trust. And it can be a little bit shaky. Look, I'm not very high on, on Taylor Rapp. I'm just going to mm -hmm. be honest with you. I know he played really good in that Miami game at the end of the year and got hurt, missed the playoffs, which turned out to be a pretty big blow for the Bills. But it's a big ass to, to, to come out and give you what Jordan Poyer did at any point of the late, even the last couple of years. I'm not basically what I'm telling you, buddy, is I'm not sold on the safety position. I think right it, now. I think it's gonna be I think it's all right to expect that there's gonna be a drop off in safety play. You mm -hmm. know, even if there's you know, and then if there's not, that's that's just a uh, a pleasant surprise, you know, if 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 you know Rap or Bishop and Edwards can come in and do the job. But I think I, I think it's just I think it's fair to expect that there's gonna be you know some lapses in the safety play that yet that we haven't seen in the past because we've been so lucky to have, you know, the, the same two guys for so long. Off, off uh, topic, not off topic, but a bold prediction. Let me throw a bold prediction out at you, man. Week two, the Bills play in Miami, right? I think that's week mm -hmm. two at Miami Thursday night. Thursday night. Week three, don't be surprised if your starting tandem for the Buffalo Bills at safety is Cole Bishop and Micah Hyde at that point. <laughs> it would uh, not yeah. shock me at all. Nothing will shock me when Micah Hyde, by the way. He could sign with the Bills a day before camp. He could miss mini camp or, or I'm sorry, training camp, sign the preseason, sign before the season, or it can not play at all. Right. Nothing, everything is on the table when it comes to Micah Hyde. The fact that the, the Bills re-signed Taylor Rapp but then still use a second round pick on Cole Bishop tells me that They're that job, sold either. yeah, that's a competition. That is going to be maybe, like I said, the uh, training camp competition. Anyway, and then the other thing that I think is fair to question right now is let me ask you this. Obviously, Josh Allen was the strength of the football team. I said, of course, he's been the strength of the football team for the last few years. But would you, wouldn't you say maybe the offensive line might have been like second like yeah. in terms of like a consistent strength of this football team? It was clearly the best offensive line I think Josh Allen ever had. There were times, you know, in years prior where where there was a guy or two on the offensive line where like he's just, you know, wasting space. What are yeah. we doing? But like last year, I, at least for me personally, I didn't feel that with the offensive line at all. I know Spencer Brown is a name that pops into my mind as someone who's like, all right, he needs to pick it up. He's been doing this long enough. But even last year, I didn't really see really so many. I'm, I know I used this word earlier, but lapses in, in yeah. Spencer Brown's play. I mean, everyone was pretty solid. You know, I would agree. Yeah. I think the offensive line was a big strength last year. Spencer Brown was really good last year. He stayed healthy. Yeah. It, it turns out Brandon Bean was correct. You know, about a, 12 months or so ago, Brandon Bean was talking to the media at some point last offseason and said, I'm, based, I'm, I'm paraphrasing, but I want to give him more time because he was hurt last year. He had a bad back in 2022. Yeah. So, and he looked kind of shitty. And I was very concerned about the right tackle position. But Spencer Brown stayed healthy last year. I thought it was a big asset to this team. Deion Dawkins has become very reliable. He's been a multi-time pro bowler now. Quite frankly, I really don't know that he's a Pro Bowl left tackle, but he's certainly a good left tackle. You feel good about him out there. Um, Osiris Torrance looked really good as a considering he was a rookie anyway. Connor McGovern was perfectly fine at guard, I thought, mm -hmm. for the most part. And then Mitch Morse was your anchor at center, and his, you know, it's been a concussion issue with him, but that didn't rear its ugly head last year. He was healthy, played every game. That offensive line started all 17 games, all five guys. None of them missed the game. Doesn't happen often where no offensive linemen miss the game. Anyway, getting to the long winded point here, the Bills cut Mitch Morse yep. in the offseason. And they move Connor McGovern to center. And then they take David Edwards, who was that six offensive lineman last year who played that role so well. And it certainly appears like he's being, he's not going to get much challenge, I don't think, to, to be the other starting guard alongside Torrance. Connor McGovern's played center before he played center in high school college a tiny bit in dallas but mm -hmm. if you got a big question mark on this offense right now is is he going to be a good nfl center right now because again if you're a super bowl contender you can't be having an inconsistent center i mean look if 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 we're, if worrying if an interior lineman is going to be able to, you know, play a different interior line position than the one that he played last year is your biggest concern on the offensive line. I think we're doing pretty good. That's fair. You know, um, 
But, uh, but he because, touches the ball every play. Yeah, absolutely. The center I mean, touches the ball every single play. I think I think that's something where be, because with being a high school quarterback myself, mm -hmm. um, I was always taking snaps with you know whoever was going to be playing center, sure. no matter what. So I, I don't really think that's going to be a huge concern about you know snapping the ball and making sure Josh gets it, not you know not going over his head or rolling it or something like that. Mm -hmm. um, because I think that's just something that they're going to practice and it's going to be like the back of their hand, you know, if it's not already. Um, I, sure. I think that's something that isn't really a huge concern for me, but I think what would be is snapping and then, you know, his jump off to his first, uh, his first step for his block. He, I, I guess if anything, that's what Yeah, and he's got, me. look, I mean, he does, it's not like he's never not played any center in the NFL. Uh, so I get right. that. And you also, this comes down to, do you have confidence and faith in the decisions that the front office and the coaches are making? I would certainly imagine that Aaron Cromer had plenty of to say if, you know, if they really didn't believe in Connor McGovern moving to center, you find a way to keep Mitch Morris. Right. I mean, they could have restructured his contract, could have... Ask them to take a pay cut. Maybe they did, for all we know. But yeah, if they really didn't believe in Connor McGovern, they probably don't get rid of Mitch Morse. Because at the same time, Bean hasn't really been talking about this being like a rebuilding, take a step back here. I mean, I think they're still going. They call it, it transition. Right. That's you know, a tra it's a yeah, year of yeah, transition. Yeah, a transitional year. But I mean, My a, ass. a lot of teams have transitional years that are still good. Sure. You know, so, yeah. you know, I. It's still, I, I'm it, it ca cautiously optimistic is going to be, I think, my theme throughout the preseason because I, there's just no, you're not, outward, not, you're not, you're, so, you're, you you're less outwardly optimistic than you were last year, though. Yeah. Eh, I don't blame you, man. I don't blame you. Look, I agree about Connor McGovern. I think, I certainly think he's capable of playing center. Again, if you believe in the coaching staff in the front office, you want to have confidence that they know what they're doing, that they're competent. But I still got to see it in games. Mm -hmm. I got to see Connor McGovern go out there and perform well at center because I look at an offensive line last year that played together all 17 games, 19 games. If you got the playoffs, literally no one missed a single game and they all graded relatively well. And I always had the mindset of if it ain't broke, don't fix it. But I'm not trying to run a salary cap. You know, yeah, I'm exactly. trying to, trying and, to run a football team with, a, with, with salary cap problems. And, and you don't have to trade a star receiver. That's going to have 31 <laughs> dead cap this yeah, year. That's you know, absolutely so. true. Although I'm, Believe in more and more and more. The fact that the Bills were willing to eat $3 million more money beyond the salary cap hit for Stefan Diggs tells me that that was also a football move as much as a salary move because they were eating that money no matter what. Mm -hmm. So that was a football move. Mitch Morse, I still feel largely it was, it was more of a financial move. And hey, we got a guy who's played center before. Let's also not lose sight. They did draft a guy in the fifth round from Georgia, uh, Seth Graham Ranger, or Van Granger, who started three years at Georgia as a center. I don't think you can expect a fifth rounder to come in as a rookie and push to, to be a starter, but he's probably going to be the backup. And if for some reason something happens to, to Connor or he's not playing well, you know, who knows? Maybe next thing you know, Josh Allen is a rookie behind center, which I don't want to see that. Mm. No. Um, a couple more things. Who do you think, like, again, if we were talking a year or so ago and we were going to preview training camp, let's say it's a couple weeks ahead of time. We're still a month out from camp. But we would have said, yeah, who do you like? Who don't you like? I would almost be willing to bet you that the name Christian Benford would not have come up because training camp for the corners last year, it was Trey White, 100% back from injury because he came back in 2022, but he was a shell of himself. Right. Kind of like Vaughn was this past year, but he looked really good at camp and he was a hundred percent. It would have been him. And then now you got a battle. You got your first round guy, Kyrie Elam. Is he going to be a good player? Is this dude going to be a bust? And then you got Dane Jackson, who is a very safe player. He's a high floor, but a low ceiling. He ain't mm. never going to be a star corner but he's also not some bottom of the roster scrub either. You kind of knew what you were getting with Dane. Sir. Anyway, you talk about those guys and like, that's what we're going to be looking at at training camp. What happens? Christian Benford beats out both Dane Jackson and Kyrie Elam, and Christian Benford goes on to have a hell of a year. 
and really firmly established himself as the number two corner on his team. And then you got Terrell Bernard a year ago. Are you kidding me? Tremaine Edmonds leaves. You don't draft anybody. You don't sign anybody. And you're going to have Terrell Bernard and Tyrell Dodson as your training camp battle. I mean, what the fuck? Mm. Right? Right. That's what you said a year ago, right? I I actually might. I think I remember having a conversation like that in one of my group chats. Like, what are we doing at linebacker outside of Milano? Yeah. Yeah. I I, I, in in a sea full of bad takes. I probably had (laughs) some of the worst ever when it came to Terrell Bernard last year. He didn't even play in the preseason. I went to a lot of training camp. He didn't do shit in training camp. Didn't even play. He got hurt in the preseason, missed the preseason, still started. And to me, it wasn't like, boy, he didn't win the job. Tyrell Dawson just sucked in the preseason. (laughs) And look, again, what happened? Gerald Menard becomes a stud instantly. And to his credit, Tyrell Dawson had a very good season once Matt Milano went down. Tyrell Dawson gave the Bills plenty of good things. Anyway, my point was, did not see that shit coming a year ago, though, you know, before it happened. You look at this roster right now. Is there anyone who kind of, like, sticks out to you, a veteran, a rookie or something, or you're like, nobody's talking about this player right now, but look out for this guy because because he, he he's going to be better than pretty much everybody thinks. And all of the wide receivers um, that that have been mentioned, I think I think the X factor this year for us is Kurt, is Curtis Samuel. Yeah. Because of his because of his time with Joe Brady before, he's already got that um experience with him. He's already had, like you said, his best year with with Joe sure. Brady. Um, he's got one of the top two, you know, two, three quarterbacks in the league and Josh Allen throwing him the ball now. You know, he's versatile. Um, he's looking for that quote unquote breakout year because you know he's you know, he's been productive, but sure. he hasn't had that, you know, wow, he's a star year yet. But I think I think this year is gonna be that year for him. I think he's I think he's gonna be the one that uh, not replaces Diggs, but I think takes the m- most of those targets that we're sure. missing from Diggs, um, whether it be out of the backfield in an extended run or from um, out wide. I think it. I think it's Curtis Samuel. I I tell you what, man. He it's funny too because he was a relevant free agent signing when the Bills signed him, but then so much shit has happened at wide receiver that he's become an afterthought in yep. a way. You know, between drafting Keon Coleman, between trading Stefan Diggs between signing two pretty well-known wide receivers well after the draft and Claypool and MVS, you know what I mean? That people, not for all the good reasons, but people certainly know who they are. So Curtis Samuel's kind of like almost slid under the radar a little bit when it comes to uh, this Bill's offense. Yeah, it's a good one for sure. Mm-hmm. I got two. I mentioned, and I won't be long on either of these, but I, I mentioned them both in passing. I really like the pick of Ray Davis. Ty Johnson will be the number two very early on in the season, but I think Ray Davis is going to have a pretty defined role early on. James Cook is a really good running back, and hopefully he can improve on not dropping the football this year because he quite literally dropped three for sure, possibly four touchdowns last year. Ray Davis is a big bruising running back, and he's also really good at catching the football out of the backfield. I'm not saying the guy's going to supplant James Cook and he's going to run for a thousand yards, but I could see Ray Davis being that solid, steady running back too, who gets seven to eleven carries a game, maybe. Yeah. Catches a couple balls out of the backfield, maybe runs for four hundred to five hundred fifty yards, finds the end zone five, six times. I think he'll be a guy who has a good role. And then the other guy I just mentioned him a minute ago. It's MBS, believe it or not. I- I'm telling you now, man, there's I liked that signing a lot. Chase Claypool is the guy that we talk about for good reason because he's a polarizing player. But it's MVS that I actually like on this football team. He drops the ball terribly. It's maddening. He's kind of know the feeling from Gabe Davis. But give me more players on this football team that are winners. Give me more players on this football team that play better in the playoffs than they do in a regular season. And that's quite literally what MVS does. He's had some of his best games in the postseason. He's won two Super Bowls. He's played with Aaron Rodgers, Pat Mahomes, and now Josh Allen. The kid is a winner. He's a deep threat. He's a big guy, but he can get down the field. I think he's going to have a nice role. Like you said, ain't nobody replacing single-handedly what Stefan Diggs did. So I'm not, that's not where I'm going with this. But he's going to be a guy who's going to make some big plays for the Bills. 
And also, we didn't even mention him tonight. Matt Collins is another guy that I like, yeah. too. He's a, he's a good blocker, good special teams guy. I think maybe he could be what Trent Shurfield, what the Bills wanted Trent Shurfield to be last year. So, yeah, I don't know. Again, it's just weird because this first time in five years, no superstar receiver. You know, there's always digs. You don't yeah. worry about digs. Oh, this is the year Gabe Davis is going to break out to. Now it's like kind of exciting. It's like, who's going to step up, man? Who's going to be that guy? You know what I mean? That's kind of fun about this team. And like how you said about, you know, Curtis Samuel kind of being swept under the radar because all the wide receiver things, MVS especially, you know, yeah. you know, you heard about him getting signed and then you haven't really heard too much about him because like you said, Claypool being so polarizing and him being here and having such a great mini camp and, yeah. you know, and then uh, with, you know, Coleman uh, especially being the rookie sure. guy, is he going to be good or not? You know, oh, there's been a a few guys, you know, you said Hollins too, that have just been, you know, wide receiver signings. I think I've said everyone been... on this roster at some point. I, <laughs> my, my, my model, Zach, is if I throw enough darts at the wall, I'm going to hit a couple of them, man, at some point. And then I kind of like forget about the ones that I'm wrong about. And then I clip the ones that I'm right about. So in the future, I can put it up on Twitter and tell people how smart and how brilliant Huh. I've no. been the whole time. You know, I thought it was weird that you've never been on all takes exposed before. <laughs> <laughs> That's true. That's true. All right. Last couple of things here too. You know, one other thing about the bills that I don't think enough people are talking about, and I don't want to take credit for it because someone else actually said it, but I'm not going to give that person credit because I can't remember who told me it, but I believe it. When I, when it pops in my mind, I'll let you know. Anyway, one good thing about the bills right now is that, the expectations are lower. Sometimes a team will play better when people don't believe in them. It becomes really good bulletin board material. Look at last year after the, the article came out about Sean McDermott. You know what I mean? After that Philly game, whether you love the article, whether you hated the article, that's not really important. What matters is it was evident that that football team rallied around Sean McDermott. They, they, they felt like it humanized them a little bit. And this team rallied and played much better around them after that. Right now, you know, over the last couple of years, the Bills, again, they've been this, the, the chic pick to win the Super Bowl. This year, that's not the case. Nobody thinks the Bills are going to the Super Bowl right now. Kind of sometimes having lowered expectations might make you play a little bit looser. Again, it motivates you more, gives you more bulletin board material. Yep. You kind of agree with that? Like that's a... Uh, that's something that actually could play to the Bills' advantage right now is that not a lot of people around the league, at least, even believe in them. I absolutely do. I think it's – I've always, with the Bills especially, you know, and this is kind of going to kind of contradict what I said earlier about the national media, but when when people aren't talking about them or when people aren't giving, you know, or picking them on Sundays, you know, mm -hmm. um, it, it get I, – I like I like that more because too. you know I, they tend to win those games. Yeah, you know you go all the way back to the Dallas Thanksgiving game when you know we beat them so bad. I mean, yeah. no no one thought that we were going to go in there and right. beat Dallas on Thanksgiving in Jerry World. You know, but I think the Bills have always thrived when the expectations are lower. Yeah, you know it's it's going to haunt me that I can't believe I cannot remember. It's been on the show somebody within the last week. PK, it was PK from the Buffalo Sports Collective. There you go, PK. I got to give your boy the credit. It was not me who came up with that philosophy. It really has resonated in my mind. Not enough to remember who said it, apparently, but PK is 100% right. He thinks that the Bills are going to be a better football team this year because he thinks that they're going to be looser because they have lowered uh, expectations. Before we get out of here, so when I have you on the show in the future, too, not, I mean, we're talking Bills today. Pretty much this was all Bills. Your first time on a full show. Mm -hmm. Um well, we're going to talk plenty of Sabres, too. Not really just a, not a lot to talk about right now. It will soon. You know, the draft's coming up. Free agency. You, you got to hope and assume that the Sabres will make some moves, maybe trade or two or whatever. But quickly here, before we get out of here, like, where are you at right now with this team? This was obviously an incredibly frustrating year after what was a very promising year uh, just one season before that. When I when we did our podcast that I was on, um, I had a little segment that I did, and uh, it was kind of like where I just kind of gave a take and went with, went with it. And one of them was wasn't it a quake take or something? yeah, something like yeah, it was, like that, that. It was Zach's take quake. Uh, <laughs> I like that man. That might maybe want we'll to bring that back for this show. Uh, Go ahead. Um, I, I forget what, it was I forget exactly when it was, but regardless, I remember saying uh, that. I think the Sabres would be better if we had a coach like Lindy Ruff. Yeah. Oh, we have a coach like, like Lindy Ruff again. 
Um, the thing about the Sabres for me is, is I, I think things have been so bleak um, because they've just been m- middling at best for, you know, 13, 13 years now without being in the playoffs. Um, and another, and another drought that Zach has spent half his <laughs> life going through, man. But it's crazy. At least, at least I do remember the Sabres being good. I do remember sure. those 05, 06, 07 years. But anyways, um, <laughs> uh, I, I don't, I, I don't love how they keep on bringing some of the same guys back. You know, your Zemgus Gergensons. You know, I think, sure. you know, I'm glad, you know, good for him being in the cup final this year. But Kyla Poso, it's like, and then you throw the C on him. It's like, he's a slug. I mean, he's had all those health issues, but, you know, he's, sure. you know, gotten older. It's a fourth liner, man. Absolutely. You have, I think we had too many of the same players on the, or same type players sure. in the top six, too. Um, we have a lot of guys who are like Jack Quinn. Um, I think guys who want to be good players but can't seem to take that step. Um, and th- I thought Granado was going to be that guy to you know have the player those players take that next step. You had guys who did. Tage Thompson had his best year under Granado. Yeah. Rasmus Dahlin really is, has had his best few years under Granado. You know, so there were positives there, but you know, you're still trying to figure out how to get over the hump. Um, and it, you can't keep on bringing the same guys back. You can't be, you know, flirting with the salary cap floor. But then at the same time, guys want to have to play here, and they don't because we're not winning. Well, you got to win, man. You got to win for sure. You know, it's funny, too, because a year ago, Lindy Ruff, Sabres head coach, it felt like a novelty, you know, funny, you know, fantasy idea almost. Not, And I say that. Because a year ago, he was coaching the New Jersey Devils, who had the most points in the NHL coming off a season, the most points in the history of their franchise. So I was like, what are you talking about? So Lenny Russ going to get fired less than a year after having the most points in the NHL? And the Sabres are going to go back down, and Granado's going to get fired, and then Lenny Ruff's going to be your head coach? I'm like, what? And that's another thing about uh, about that whole thing is wherever Lindy goes, he makes the playoffs and very sure, soon, you know, so that's another reason. At, at least that's a reason to, you know, believe that, you know, maybe that can, they can get over the hump because at least with the roster that they had this past year, they were close. You know, sure. they were still, you know, a few points out, but I think they have too many you know, stretches where they're going pointless or they're only, you know, getting a point in every, you know, yeah. you know six possible or something. They, like they that, would, you know? yeah, they went stretches where, where they got themselves in a hole. They can ultimately never get out of. And then every time they manage to creep close, they give them four points. That's when they would come out and they would actually have their worst game. I feel like Don Granado was the guy that helped develop some young players and, and help them get to a next level. But I think as a team, they were going as far as they were going to go with him. And what I like personally most about Lindy Ruff is, and again, at the risk of like almost being like a nostalgic fan, you know, bring back Lindy Ruff. I've been saying that for years and years and years. To do it at this time, I actually think is the right move because this team, quite frankly, needs a coach who's going to kick them in the ass yep. and hold them accountable. Because I think the single biggest problem with the Sabres last season, why they underachieved as badly as they did, is it was just a complete. This comes to Kyle Oposo, the captain, the leaders of that room, the head coach. It was just a lack of accountability. They might say the right things when they would actually bother to talk to the media and not sneak out the back door like a lot of those players were doing. But there's just a lack of accountability. You can even sense it during locker cleanout day after, right after Granado got fired. Almost like they were starting to throw the head coach under the bus. There's a bunch of players that need to look themselves in the mirror. And if they're not going to do it, Lenny Ruff's going to come in and do it for him. I really, you know, it was it was when when we lost to Columbus after or right before beating Toronto earlier in the year when we mm. lost like nine to three. Yeah. And when when they were Bearson. blowing Granado and when you know yep. the players went back to the locker room or were calling out the fans. That's for me when I, I it's the same thing. It's like you guys have a total lack of accountability on yeah. this team. You can't win, you like know. That. And then and especially for you know, it was the captain calling out the fans. You know, you know we're you know we're trying our hardest. We love Donnie, <laughs> 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 but. It, it, and that that's all well and good, but like you're not winning, you know, right. and you're and you're getting slaughtered by some other really bad teams, i.e. Yeah. Columbus. Well, know? like I said, for right now it's kind of a little bit of a a slow time with the NHL, but it's certainly going to be picking up real soon. We'll talk about that in the future. Matter of fact, that's going to do it uh, for this episode. I'll tell you what, man, it's kind of like having you on for the first time here in studio, and I'm sure you feel the same way. It's kind of like two boxers maybe early on in a fight. You kind of like the first couple rounds, you're feeling it out, feeling each other out, and then you kind of 
get into whatever your offense is going to be. Take some time to to develop that 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 rapport. Mm-hmm. I feel like we're getting it, man. We're getting it. Did a good job. Appreciate you having you on, man. Look forward to having you back on again. Thanks for having me. This is exciting. Yeah, this was cool, man. All right. So thank you, everybody out there as well for, for watching and for listening. And I will be back, like I said, tomorrow's episode. I am at 26 Shirts with uh, founder of 26 Shirts, co-founder of Bill's Mafia, Del Reed. And again, go check out Centered on Buffalo, Eric Woods podcast. I'm on that today. Talk to you guys later.